Good afternoon. Let's get started. Our speaker next week will be Professor Martin Keeney of the University of California, Davis. He will talk to us about venture capital funding of clean energy technologies and especially some of the challenges that VC and uh, the VC industry has had in funding these energy technology innovations, which are long time horizon, but then also they are capital uh, intensive. So he'll uh, talk to us about uh, that. It's a great pleasure to introduce to you our speaker today, uh, Dr. Sazin Atari, who is an assistant professor at the School of, Environmental, uh, School of Public and Environmental Affairs at Indiana University. Before that, Sazin was a postdoctoral fellow at Columbia University's Earth Institute. Sazin's work is really very gripping and interesting and very, very relevant uh, as we see different aspects of energy and water, especially uh, here becoming more and more uh, salient and important. Uh, her research focuses on the psychology of resource use, in particular on identifying factors that promote sustainability and conservation. Her research, both on energy actually, uh, a few years ago, and more recently on water, has been published in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, and that research has also been discussed widely, including in The Economist, in New York Times, uh, in CNN, in BBC, and, and many other uh, outlets, a really very relevant uh, and important research uh, that Sajin has been uh, doing. Her doctoral degrees are in civil and environmental engineering and engineering and public policy. These are two programs at Carnegie Mellon University. And before that, she has a uh, bachelor's degree in engineering physics from uh, UIUC. Uh, so it's a great pleasure, Sajin, that you're here with us. Uh, we really look forward to your talk. All right. Thank you all. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, thank you so much for inviting me to Austin. This is my first time, and I've been told that I should say, go Longhorns. <laughs> right, that was my joke for the, for the day. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so today I'd like to talk to you about water and energy use, effective actions, perceptions, and systems thinking. I'd like to make this a little bit more interactive so um, you guys can give me ideas, and then I can go explore them. So uh, hopefully this will be a lot of fun. If you'd like to find out more about our research, you can check out our website. Um, you can check out our website um, at the bottom, and you can also shoot, feel free to shoot me an email after the talk if you'd like. Uh, so today I'll be talking to you about two papers that have already been published, and then two papers that I'm working on as we speak. Um, our lab actually does quite a bit of research on a variety of topics, including uh, work in Zambia and Kenya, uh, looking at um, the effectiveness of my, uh, the fact that I flew today and how does that affect my credibility, so on and so forth, but I'm not going to talk about that today. We're just going to be sort of focusing on uh, water and energy. So um, in the first paper, uh, the water shortlist that was published with Ben Inskeep and myself in um, Environment last year, that looked at what are the most effective behaviors that we can incorporate to decrease water use in our homes. And in the second two papers, Perceptions of Water Use and Energy Use, um, we're going, sort of going to explore uh, what people think are the most effective behaviors, how accurate are their perceptions, and what are the factors that predict accuracy. All right, so since this is going to be really interactive, um, what are the top five activities that would save the most water in your home indoors? Go. Shower. Shower, shower more, shower less, just shower. Do not ever shower. What? <laughs> five-minute showers. So the average is eight minutes in the United States, so five-minute showers are awesome. Don't flush the toilet. Don't flush the toilet. Beautiful. <laughs> ever. Well, I don't know about that. I, I'm not coming over to your house. Yeah. Um, using water-efficient dishwashers. Yep, dishwashers. What else? Turning off the light switch. Light switch for water. OK, if you think about the entire life cycle, sure, nerd. Yep. <laughs> Oh, air drying, air drying clothes, yep. Water efficient lawns? Indoors. You have an. Oh, water efficient indoor plants. <laughs> <laughs> awesome save, yes. Uh, you guys are really good. Uh, I think you guys have done your research. Um, so here are behaviors that are perceived most effective. This is what people think, okay? So shorter showers, 43% of our participants, and this is an online sample of convenience, MTurk. We can talk about sampling if you'd like at the end. Um, 10% said, turn off water while doing activities not including brushing my teeth. 
7% said turn off while brushing my teeth. Conserve water, use it efficiently, which is a little bit uh, vague, and do less laundry or full loads of laundry. What do you notice about these uh, behaviors? So roughly 70 to 73% uh, are these actions. What, do you, what are the common commonalities across these behaviors? What do you say? Yeah, the everyday activities. What else? Yeah. Um, they're all to do with like turning off. Yeah, exactly. Really your exactly. So all of these are curtailment actions, and there's no mention of toilets, right? <laughs> and um, I, I know toilets are sexy, so let's talk about toilets for a second. Uh, so this is this is data from Peter Mayer, Mayer and uh, Bill Diorio in 1999, and this is actually where the EPA is still using their data for uh, residential end uses of water. So what they found, and this was also a sample of convenience, uh, the top water user in the home, inside the home, are your toilets, followed by clothes washers, showers, faucets, leaks, and others. So what, what you notice from the previous data is toilets doesn't even make the top 70, like the 70% 70 of the participants don't even mention toilets. So that's like our first surprise finding. So what we did was, uh, so Ben Inskeep and I, what we looked at is, all right, we looked at the home and we tried to figure out if you were to uh, incorporate energy, uh, water efficiency as well as curtailment, which is basically doing the same behavior but less of it, what are the most effective behaviors in the home? So the number one behavior we found was installing a low flush toilet followed by using a water efficient clothes washer, so on and so forth. So this basically identifies, using engineering estimates, what are the most effective behaviors you can do in, if you wanted to decrease your water use. Does that make sense? Okay. So how do people perceive how much water is used by a variety of different activities? And that's something that I've been pretty curious about for a long time. So this was actually inspired by this great paper that was published in 1978 by Sarah Lichtenstein et al. So what they did back in the day, uh, before many of you were born, is um, they asked people for these 30 different causes of death, how many people die every year, okay? So on your uh, y-axis, you have estimated number of deaths per year, and on your x-axis, you have actual number of deaths per year. So it goes from 1, 10, 100, so it's a log-log scale. So what you find is data that lies along the diagonal line means that people's perceptions match reality. Data that lies above the line means that people are overestimating these causes of death, Data that lies under the line means people are underestimating these, uh, these risks. So what is it that you notice with this graph? Kind of like spectacular events maybe are above the line, overestimated. So things like botulism, tornadoes, smallpox vaccines are overestimated. So, so, so people in general think that more people die from these risks. Things like stroke, stomach cancer, diabetes, all cancer, all disease are under the line. So people think less people, fewer people die from those risks. What, a, what do you think causes that? So, so they actually uh, coined this as an overestimation, underestimation bias. Why do you think that happens? I think it's just because there's more media coverage of people who yeah. die. Yeah, it's more available, right? So, that's, so the, I wanted to kind of create this curve for water and electricity. So that's exactly what we ended up doing. So over here you have perceived water use in gallons on your y-axis and actual water use in gallons on your x-axis. Data that lies along the diagonal means uh, perceptions match reality, okay? So this is what your curve looks like. You have everything from efficient flush, standard flush, leaky faucets, garden hoses, jacuzzis, outdoor pools. Um, what is the general trend? It's underestimation, right? Most of the data points are below the diagonal. So let me walk you through some specific examples. So an efficient dishwasher is actually overestimated by a factor of 1.7. So what that means is people think it uses 7.3 gallons, uh, but it actually uses 4.3. Uh, standard washer is underestimated by a factor of 3. So people think it uses 14 gallons when it actually uses 40. Things like the outdoor pool are underestimated by a factor of 18. So people think it roughly uses 900 gallons when it actually uses 17,000 um, gallons. So the question then is, is that why is this underestimation happening when you're thinking about water use? Now, what, what uh, the literature shows us is that this is, there's this phenomenon called anchoring and insufficient adjustment. So when you think about it, we really understand what a gallon looks like. You know, we buy gallons of milk, gallons of gasoline. So things that are in estimations or activities that use roughly in, um, um, 
uh, amounts of water, volumes of water that are within this um, gallon metric understanding, we get correctly. Things that are sort of much more than that, we, we anchor to the gallon estimate and we insufficiently adjust our other estimates to that. Does that make sense? You're basically anchored to this number and then you're underestimating everything else because you're really thinking about, you really understand what that one metric looks like. You guys with me so far? All right. So this is the only slide with an equation. Um, so what we did was we looked at the relationship between participants' perceptions uh, as a function of actual water use using a multi-level model. Now, why did we use a multi-level model? Every single individual was asked for maybe 10 to 15 uh, different appliances. How much water do you think this appliance uses? This appliance, this appliance. So all of the errors are correlated. So this, this model actually takes care of the correlation within your um, errors. Um, so I can, I can talk more about this model at the end, but let me explain it using a curve. Um, so as we said, uh, if, if perceptions match reality, it's a y is equal to x line. So for a y is equal to x line, what should the intercept be? Zero, and the slope should be one, right? So what we found was is that the intercept for water is actually, rather than zero, it's negative 0.3. So rather than it being zero, the whole curve is shifted down. So that means that in general, there's an underestimation. We know the slope should be one. So rather than the slope being one, it's 0.7. So rather than it being as steep, it's a little bit shallower, right? So what the, what the shallowness means is that thing, um, activities that are supposed to be spread apart are smushed or compressed together. So the thing is, I, I know I can correctly rank order these appliances. So I know that uh, a dishwasher uses more water than um, uh, uh, a standard flush. But I don't know by how much more. So th that's the how much more is the part that people get lost in. So the relative differences are compressed. So uh, just to put that um, last, uh, uh, that last um, um, information onto one simple graphic, what we found is that uh, people who were numerate, who understood numbers, people who were male and people who were older had more accurate perceptions of water use. I tested this, checked it. Unfortunately, it's, that's what the data shows. <laughs> um, I'm not going to read too much into it. <laughs> so now let's look at it for electricity. So uh, our lab has been doing uh, water and electricity work sort of side by side. Um, have you ever asked somebody who's not uh, in your friend circle or cohort or an engineer what a watt hour is? Have you tried? What, what, what do they say usually? A what? A what what? <laughs> Not a what, a what hour. <laughs> Not a what. <laughs> so it's, it's really hard, right? So uh, this is work from my PhD. So I started by asking people uh, if they understood what hours, and most people don't. Um, and actually, our, um, the physicist Rich, Richard Feynman is known to have said that energy is a really tough, uh, tough thing to explain to people and visualize very clearly. So in this particular study, we had to provide people with a referent that they understood, right? So what we did was we said, assume a 100 watt light bulb being left on for one hour uses 100 units of energy. How many units of energy would your TV take? How many units of energy would your computer take in one hour? Does that make sense? So we had to actually provide people with a metric that they understood. So you guys ready for the data? Yes. Okay. So this is what the data looks like. What do you notice? Whispers. Yeah? What do you say? The bigger it gets, the, yeah, the bigger it gets, it becomes almost a flat line, right? It becomes almost horizontal. I really, I mean, so people in general cannot really differentiate between a space heater, wa changing your washer settings. It's, I mean, it's all in sort of, it saves a lot of energy, but I have no idea how much. So it becomes super flat. So let's walk through some specific examples for this one. So laptops are overestimated by a factor of two. Dishwashers are underestimated by a factor of 800 times. So, so the underestimation becomes really severe very, very quickly for energy, as opposed to water. So for energy, again, the intercept, rather than uh, being zero, it was negative 0.44. So it's much, much more of an underestimation. And the slope, rather than being one, was 0.28. So it's much flatter in general. So uh, for energy, for electricity, people who are numerate and who had pro-environmental attitudes had more accurate perceptions. 
However, and here's a surprise finding, is that people that currently engaged in some of these environmental behaviors had worse perceptions. This is not something I've studied very closely, but one hypothesis for this, for this finding could be a warping effect, that I'm focusing on behaviors that I'm doing and not focusing on behaviors that I'm not doing, and that leads to um, misperceptions in the way I think about energy. So these are what the two curves look like together, and I think this, to me, is really interesting. Why is this interesting to me, you might ask? Why is it interesting to you? So we think about energy and water really differently. For example, for water, I expand many, many, many more orders of magnitude, and the curve is really far closer to the diagonal than the, than the curve for electricity. The curve for electricity becomes a flat line very quickly. So what this tells me is that people seem to understand, can quantitatively estimate water use much better than quantitatively estimating electricity use. Does that make sense? Um, so that's, that's one of our surprise findings so far. Uh, putting those two studies together, what we've, and, um, again, the, est the uh, intercept for uh, energy is far lower than for water. The slope is far flatter than for water. Numeracy is really important for both. And in general, people think about curtailment rather than efficiency. And so that's something else we're actually planning to explore in the future is why is it that if I were to ask you what is the single most effective thing you can do to decrease resource use in your life, the first thing that you think about is curtailment as opposed to efficiency. Um, some ideas for that might be that you, know, you, really do not, you really want to avoid the upfront capital cost. So you think about anything that you can do without having to spend money, right? And so we're trying to figure out what are the mental models behind why people are thinking that way. Um, I just threw this in there because I think this is really interesting as well. People have no idea about embodied water. And actually, I don't really have any idea about embodied water, except now I know that almonds are really bad because of the media, right? So what, over here, what we did was we asked people just to rank order these different foods in terms of embodied water, how much water went into producing them. As you can tell, it's a flat line when it should be far steeper. Um, and the thing is, we really have no idea. So this is another sort of uh, area where information provisions might be an interesting uh, thing to explore. So our findings so far is that we have severe misperceptions about how much energy and water different activities use, the many implications for technology, education, and policy. But in, in terms of psychology, we have a severe anchoring and insufficient adjustment problem. So when it comes to electricity, we really think about natural anchors, such as laptop computers, desktop computers, light bulbs, and we anchor to those and insufficiently adjust all of the different appliances in our lives based on that anchoring uh, issue. For water, the anchoring is not as sticky of a problem as it is for electricity, uh, but anchoring and insufficient adjustment is, is pretty strong in both. The good news is that perceptions of water use are more accurate than energy, and numeracy is really, really important for uh, accurate perceptions. The bad news is people are really thinking about curtailment as opposed to efficiency. Uh, perceptions of water use and uh, electricity both suffer from severe underestimations. And then participants were unable to even rank order these different activities in terms of embodied um, water content. So with that, I've sort of finished some of the work that's already done and I've tied a ribbon on it. Any questions so far? Yeah. So we've not done embodied energy so far, but that would be really interesting, but I'm expecting it would be really, really flat. I can, I can, I can give you a dollar if it isn't. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. Can I make anchoring and insufficient adjustment to the price of the commodity? I mean, if, if it has a price, <coughs> uh, I can probably associate to it, uh, I don't know, something like that. So, the, so this, this phenomenon of anchoring and insufficient adjustment is something that was coined by Amos Tversky and Danny Kahneman. And basically what, the, what it says is that even if you give someone uh, an irrelevant anchor, so if I ask you to think about the last two digits of your social security, you will anchor to that number and then when I ask you, when, when the follow-up question is how many countries are there in Africa, you will anchor to that random number uh, while, while you're coming up with an estimate for something that you don't really know that much about. So I think it would, it would spill over to the domain that you're talking about, but it depends how much knowledge people have about that domain. Does that make sense? Okay. Yep. Now that you asked them specifically gallons or electricity, but if, do people have intuition towards like pricing, like how much it costs to do the thing? Uh, we did not study that. Um, 
But I would probably say that they don't. Um, but, I'm, but that's not something we've studied as yet. So let me move on to these. Uh, so this, these are two new projects that I'm really excited about. The first one's about to get kicked out the door, and the second one is work in progress. So if you have any ideas, I'm, I'm all yours. So the first one is tapping perceptions of water systems. Uh, so do people really understand the entire system of connected processes that are required to deliver potable water to your home? And what happens to the water once it leaves your home? You're, yeah, you're, you're, you're always saying no. <laughs> um, and then the second one is, is uh, does gameplay improve systems thinking, right? So uh, there are lots of current water risks, and I, I know you guys know a lot about water risks already, so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it. But in terms of qu water quality, in January of 2014, uh, there was a solvent contamination in West Virginia. It sort of contaminated 15% of the state's potable water. Uh, in terms of water quantity, we're in Texas. Uh, you guys know problems about water quantity really well already. But very recently, Governor Jerry Brown issued an emergency executive order mandating a 25% reduction in urban portable water use. And infrastructure, I think we've been getting a D plus uh, for uh, infrastructure in the United States. But aging water infrastructure is one of our nation's top water priorities. So we have lots of water risks that we're facing. So in this study, what we, what we did was we wanted to understand how do students conceptualize the entire system uh, of processes that are involved in the drinking water system and what are the factors that predict accuracy and what can, how can we use any of these tools in order for risk communication. So here's what we did. We asked students at SPIA, the School of Public and Environmental Affairs, grads and undergrads, to, to draw out what the entire system looked like. Uh, so in April 2014, students participated in an in-class paper survey. Um, roughly seven of, uh, 578 participants uh, completed the survey. However, we only have drawings from 457 participants. So the median age was 21 years, 52% female, and 14% were environmental students. So that's people fo uh, students focusing on water, um, energy, uh, natural resource use, ecology, things like that. But before getting into that, uh, I s both myself and the students spent uh, a long time looking at water engineering textbooks. Why, you ask? Not just because it's so much fun, but um, what we wanted to do is we wanted to see whether uh, uh, these textbooks had good systems understanding on the first page, right? So when you open up a textbook, you sort of wanted to see whether um, there was a good systems diagram on the first page. And what we found was one did not exist. So we went through maybe 150 textbooks. And this is one that we found that we really liked, but it still wasn't quite adequate for our purposes. So over here, you have the natural water cycle. And over here, you have the urban water cycle. But it doesn't quite show you um, how the system breaks down into home and how these two systems really interact very well. Does that make sense? So what we did before starting our study is we actually did an expert elicitation. So we went to 15 separate Indiana water experts and asked them to draw out what they thought was the correct diagram. And then we, using that, we created our own simplified diagram. So this is one of the beautiful exemplars that really should be at the beginning of every textbook. Let me just quickly walk you through it. Um, you have groundwater and surface water. Uh, she, uh, the, the expert also showed uh, the sort of the, the evapotranspiration, rain evaporation. Um, you have your drinking water treatment, filtration, flocculation, so on and so forth, potable water in to your homes, uh, dirty water out, um, uh, wastewater treatment, and then back into your natural environment. So all of the different pieces of the system are really well thought out in this diagram. So using this, we created our own very, very simplified diagram, right? So this is what uh, we, uh, we created. You have your source, which could be surface or groundwater. You have drinking water treatment, distribution, household use, collection, wastewater treatment, and return to the environment. So every single diagram that we collected from the students was graded by two separate coders for these different categories. So whether source was mentioned or not, whether drinking treatment was mentioned or not, were shown or not. Uh, distribution, home use, collection, wastewater, and uh, return to the environment. So each student got a score for each of these separate categories. You guys with me so far? All right. So the survey question was, please draw a diagram illustrating your understanding of the processes by which clean water reaches the tap in the average home in the United States. 
Please draw how water reaches the home from its original sources and is then returned to the natural environment. Show all of the processes um, that the water goes through. You're encouraged to label your drawing and add any explanations you believe would convey your understanding of the water system. Are you guys ready to see some example drawings? All right. This is my favorite. <laughs> this is what I call <laughs> the magic diagram. And actually, I think a lot of people have this mental model of the way water and electricity work, that somehow magic happens and it all works out in the end. <laughs> Wouldn't this be great? So this actually got a score of three out of seven because it shows water source, which is clouds, rain. It shows distribution through pipes, and then it shows household use right at the end. So I, I'm just trying to demonstrate how our scoring was done, okay? Um, so this is another diagram which got a score out of four, uh, four out of seven. The problem here, and this is something which was harder to code. I mean, I think this is a relatively new technique of trying to code diagrams. Um, we don't know what direction the sewage is flowing, <laughs> which is problematic, but it shows water source, household use, uh, collection system, and then wastewater or, or water treatment. So it got a score of four. And finally, this is one of, one of the, the best, which got a score of six, because it shows uh, water source, drinking treatment, uh, distribution, household use, collection system, and wastewater treatment. The only thing is it didn't really connect the cycle back. It didn't show return to environment. Okay, so this is how we scored every one of those 457 diagrams. And here are um, the very simple linear regression on the sum score. So every participant, every student had a sum score of what they received. And these are the uh, factors that were important in predicting a high value for their score. So if you were an environmental student, you had a higher sum score. If you believed that there was a risk to infrastructure, you had a higher sum score. And then finally, if you saw lots of visual cues in the environment, like um, a, you know, you've actually seen a water tower, you've actually seen a reservoir, you've actually seen um, a water meter, so on and so forth, you had a higher sum score. Okay. So what was really interesting as well is that we looked, we just asked a very simple question about: Do you think that there are risks related to water quality? water quantity and water infrastructure. And this was a very simple yes, no. There are risks or there are no, there are no risks. And this is what we find, is that uh, for environmental students, they, ha they believe that there are lots of risks related to both water quality, quantity, and infrastructure. But for non-environmental students, it really drops off. Is that, yeah, if I'm drinking it, yes, the, you know, I believe that there could be risks to it because water quality uh, risks are high. But the lowest is water infrastructure. So a lot of students don't believe, in fact, roughly 40% of the students believe that there are risks to water infrastructure. So I think that in itself is a really surprising finding because if you assume, and this is a huge assumption, if you assume that the, the public is very similar to our non-environmental students, that's probably one explanation for why um, uh, our infrastructure is underfunded. Okay? Last but not least, this is disaggregated, uh, the number of students, the percentage of students that, met, that showed each of those seven categories. What's really interesting is this, is that right after household use, it really drops off. So the, I understand the entire system until it comes to the home, and then after it reaches the home, I forget about it. Okay? So I think this also shows, tells us a lot about the way people, uh, the way students think about these systems. So in terms of results, one in five students had untreated water returning to the natural environment after use. So untreated. You guys have the image, right? Okay, just making sure. One in five students indicated filtration as the only form of drinking water treatment before household use. So basically what that means is water comes from the surface or groundwater, I just filter it and then I drink it. Okay, no chemical treatment. 56% did not draw any water treatment plant. 9% treated drinking water treatment and wastewater treatment the same. So those are pretty surprising findings, and this also highlights significant gaps in the way we think about the entire water system. Uh, perceptions of risks to infrastructure are lowest for non-environmental students, and students tend to stop thinking about the, water, the system processes after the home. So based on this research, which I thought was really interesting, I'm a little biased, um, what we wanted to do is we wanted to create a game to teach people about the system, right? So that's what we've been working on for the past couple of months. It's called Waterworks. I know it's kind of nerdy. 
Uh, so this is the front screen. You can, um, it's not ready for, for gameplay as yet. We're still working on it, but let me walk you through what we're planning to do. So this was just a mock-up that we used um, just to demonstrate how it's going to work. But this is really what the game looks like. Um, so you have uh, an ability to have uh, agriculture, industry, and residential uh, units. Um, you can have surface water or groundwater. And this is, um, th so this is one world. We actually have 10 worlds. This is what we call Happy Town because it's very happy. You have lots of water accessible. Um, and then what, what the game player will have to do is actually build the system, right? So we're going to start off with a blank slate, and you're going to have access to pipes, access to, um, uh, um, so access to pipes, collection systems, uh, water treatment plants, wastewater treatment plants, and you actually have to build up the entire system from scratch. Um, if you don't do it well, your population goes down, you lose money, and then you might like, end up in a really bad catastrophe. We're still trying to plan and design what the catastrophes look like, which is a lot of fun. Uh, faculty are really good at that. Um, <laughs> Inside joke, don't worry about it. Um, so uh, what's really, what's, what, what we're also doing is we have um, different worlds that are arid worlds, extreme wet water worlds, uh, um, where the problems that you face as a water manager are really, really different, right? In some places, water qu uh, quantity issues are really problematic. In some places, water quality issues are really problematic. And once we create these worlds, what we're also going to do is face, um, have the player face different risk scenarios. So for example, um, there's been a West Virginia type contamination spill. What do you do? So we're, what we're hoping to, to, to test is whether this type of gameplay and this type of interaction teaches people A, about the water system, and whether that changes their um, preferences uh, along the way for different water issues that we're really interested in studying. So with that, I'm going to end my talk. Thank all of my great students, collaborators, funding, experts. There are too many, 15 of them to list. Um, thank you all for your attention and open it up to questions. Thank you so much. Any questions? Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I was kind of curious about one thing. Um, did you ever like study sort of the historical um, trends of water perceptions? Because I know that like with fracking, a lot of people got a lot more concerned really quickly. So did you, did you ever study that and what did you find? So I've not studied historical trends as yet. Um, so I think what's really interesting is to study both of these issues together. So right now, as, as I said, we've been sort of lockstep, energy, water, electricity. So right now we just finished the, the water systems uh, drawing project, and now we're thinking about starting an electricity systems drawing project. But I think what you're, what you're really talking about is where these two systems really intertwine and interlink. That's something that we've not studied as yet, but I think that we could actually model that in the game, right? So for example, new industry comes about and that actually contaminates your entire water system. What do you do then? Um, I think that would be really interesting to look at, but it's not something we've done as yet. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for the talk. I had a question about the game. So do you also have like cost components uh, included in the game? Like for example, how much would relatively a wastewater treatment cost compared to a drinking water one? Yes, we do. We're still trying to figure out how to model these. So I actually had one of my students um, spend quite a bit of time trying to get cost estimates for different sized uh, drinking water treatment plants and wastewater treatment plants. And believe it or not, they really vary. Surprise, surprise. And I think it really varies based on geography and where it's located and how much water they're treating. So we've had to make a lot of estimates into how much we should price these. But we actually have a couple of different levels of wastewater treatment, and we have a couple of different levels of water treatment. And so you have money, money up there. Um, and so you actually have to have a certain amount of money to be able to upgrade to advanced treatment and so on and so forth. So we actually have included that in the, in the game but we are making wild assumptions about how to model those costs. If you have any ideas of how to model them better, let me know. Yeah. Hey, how are you? Uh, thank you oh, so much sorry. for your talk. Yep. Um, this is kind of more of a maybe a, a comment. I'd like to hear maybe your response to it uh, more than a question. But I'm an electrical engineer, so uh, I understand that side of it a little bit more. 
Um, and I know in the beginning portion of your talk, um, it seemed like people had a, a lot more difficult time per perceiving electricity use than their water use. And it's wow. because, in my opinion, you can see water, you can see it flow, you can see the volume. You can't see that on electricity. Mm -hmm. Also, the public generally has a misconception as far as energy versus power. Mm -hmm. um, even a lot of times when you talk about kilowatt hours, I get sometimes the feedback, kilowatts per hour. It's like, no, 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 kilowatts times hour. Mm -hmm. So, but that's, that's hard a lot of, for, for the general public to understand. That's a really great comment. I've spent a couple of years thinking about that. Uh, and I still don't have a very clear answer to it. So, I, so let me tell you a little bit about some of the ideas I'm playing with at the moment. And these are not sort of just between you and me and everyone else in this room, okay? Um, so I don't know how to make electricity more understandable to people. I think it's very, very, very hard. Because if you think about water, we interact with the end use almost directly, right? I shower, I mean, I, I flush. I, I mean, I see the water, right? I have this sort of visceral, even though sometimes you have to aggregate it, and people are not very good at aggregating. So if I were to ask you how many gallons of water do you flush down the loo for the entire day, in general, people, you would do much worse than if I asked you per flush, right? But let's put that on the side. With electricity, so you're an electrical engineer. You're, we're sitting in this room. The AC is really on. I can feel it. Uh, we have lights, some dimmable lights, some loud lights, some, you know, it's really hard right now for even for you to calculate the amount of electricity we're using. So even for someone who's trained in this, it's really hard. Or even Richard Feynman said it was really hard, and he was really smart, man. Um, so now let's go back to how do we improve, so there, there are two parts of your question that I'd like to address. The first one is that how do we improve perceptions? I think there's a way. Here's, what, here's the way that I think that we can improve them, but I have not tested it. Have you, do you know how to drive a stick shift car? See, I don't, but let me just use that analogy. <laughs> I hate you. Okay, anyways, this is not on tape, not for the record. I think they're actually taping me. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so let's, let's go back to your stick shift car. Just as you gear shift when you're, tr when you're changing modes in a stick shift car, you can actually gear shift with anchors. So what if when I'm thinking about appliances that use very little amounts of energy, I give you an anchor that you understand that uses very little amounts of energy? Then when you're thinking about a lot of energy, I give you an anchor that uses a lot of energy, but one that you understand. So just how you gear shift, we can get people to gear shift in their perceptions. Does that make sense? So just as your, an your anchor, rather than having one anchor that doesn't make any sense, you have multiple anchors that make sense to people. So I think that'll get the perception curve towards the diagonal. But the bigger, hairier question is how do perceptions relate to behavior, right? So, and this is something I, I was actually talking to students from the Weber group, and I asked them, you know, I, I'm not quite sure. Like, do we need to have an accurate understanding of perceptions? Or do we need to have an accurate understanding of the system in order to uh, function in the system? And that's an open question. So there was recently a paper published by Paul Slovic and others on people really do not like to drink recycled water. They think it's pee water. Right? So who wants to drink pee water? So um, would systems think, I, th I believe systems thinking in that regard, because if you, if you think you're drinking virgin water right now, which some people do, I don't even know what virgin, virgin water is, but if, if, you th if you think that that's what a status quo is, yeah, you're not going to want to sh sh uh, switch from that to this. But if you already know that, yeah, you're really drinking recycled water to begin with, then you might be more likely to switch over. But putting that on the side, you can think about ways of just going around perceptions, just directly, right? I mean, so I, I, I met with uh, Sheila Olmstead this morning. You can change prices, right? You can, you can change status quos, right? So th there's been a lot of research that shows that just even changing the status quo on uh, organ do donation has huge switches in, the, in how many people will become organ donors. And so I'm trying to figure out where and when do perceptions matter? And I'm not sure. Maybe you can tell me. Or we could talk about it later, over bourbon or something, I don't know. Any other, yeah, you had a question, go for it. Um, thanks for giving the talk. I was wondering um, if you could talk a little more about water recycling. Like I know some big universities sometimes use it to water their lawn and stuff. Is it really feasible on an energy and water level in like homes, for example? So, uh, 
I'm not going to talk to you about the engineering of it because there are people in this room that know much more about water recycling than I do. But I'm just going to sort of talk to you about what it really means on this map. So basically, rather than after your wastewater treatment, you just basically take, that, take the water from there and you divert it back to drinking water treatment. And then it goes to drinking water treatment. We're actually doing this already in a few places, right? It, so why are they doing it? Very, very, on a very basic level, it just makes it much more efficient. You're not losing water to evaporation or through the environment. Um, so it's a way to keep water where you want it so that you can quickly treat it and send it back out. Um, a friend of mine actually works in the EPA, and there are issues with that too, because the environment takes care of some pollutants that your drinking water treatment plant might not be able to take care of. So there's st we're still trying to figure out what are, th are those pollutants and how bad would they be in terms of the risks. But there are other risks that are related to, you know, the other risks in general that, that are, so that sort of come into play when you're just drinking water in general. So that doesn't quite answer your question, but I'm trying to get at from much more of a psychological perspective that it's just shortening the cycle. That's about it. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. Um, in terms of, you said that earlier when someone asked you a question about linking both the water and the, the energy usage, I was wondering if you had thought possibly about taking the water system and really seeing how much energy is being used to treat the, all this water to, you know, just in general, the energy, and then kind of relate that and see if that would work with making people. Because in the end, I guess, um, I my undergrad is also in electrical engineering, and it was really easy for me at the beginning to kind of look at, at, at electricity almost as water. You know, you have the pipes, which are the wires, and mm -hmm. the current, which is the water trap. So, the wires. Right, right. So it's, it, 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 could, it is very relatable, and it could, and I was wondering if, if that was kind of the, the next step in terms of linking both. So I think, I'm, so I'm trying to figure out what the next step is of the systems diet. I, like I, I kind of like this idea of having students draw out what the system looks like. And um, a lot of the research shows that we're becoming much more specialized in terms of specific processes. The way, so when, in terms of uh, environmental education, we're teaching uh, students very specifically about wastewater treatment as opposed to how wastewater treatment fits into everything else. Does that make sense? So that's what the research shows. So that's how environmental education is moving forward. Um, I would like to, f f f I, th I think for, our, for, for me, I would actually like to see what are these diagrams like for electricity systems. I'm not sure what they would look like, whether it's going to be like magic out of com coming out of the wall with like big arrows and I don't know, Zeus with the, <laughs> with the I don't know what I'm talking about now. So I, I, I don't know what that would look like. And I think that the level after that would be actually seeing whether people understand the connection between this electricity, um, energy, water nexus, which is what you're talking about. But I think that we're still a couple of steps uh, behind. But it's a great project, Varun, for us to do together. Um, I have a question if you are including what types of water is usable, so I know that only like 1% or something like that is actually potable, so are you going to incorporate that into your gain and how that might change perceptions about efficiency? So we're actually not thinking about including that. So what we're doing with the game is we're actually keeping the amount of potable water constant per world. So there are 11 worlds that we've created so far. So every world has a certain amount of water that's, that we consider as potable. Um, I think if we wanted to move more realistically, that would be a good way of doing it. But the, the, this game is sort of, we're trying to be very specific about what this game is for. And it's sort of designed for people to think much more as, uh, in terms of systems thinking. So do you know the different components that are required? And how do you deal with these scenarios or these stressors when they come about? But I think that, that would be really interesting to include for um, future, future games if we keep going down this route. Yeah. Uh, very interesting work. Thank you for sharing. Uh, I, I talked about turning the light switch off only somewhat okay. tongue-in-cheek. Yeah. And so I'm going to poke on that some more. Yeah. Um, we as a water research community, I think, are doing the public a disservice. And the most water efficient thing you can do is eat vegetable proteins in a natural light-filled home, you know, ideally looking at a Xeriscaped yard. 
and you could leave all your faucets running that entire time and you'd still be a net water saver. Mm -hmm. And I think by only talking about and by only studying, by only surveying the evident, the visible water uses like toilets and sinks and, and laundry, you know, we're creating penny-wise, pound-foolish consumers of water and of electricity. Um, and, and I think you had data that showed that with embodied water. You know, that's most evident because that was the most erroneous perception the public had. You know, how can we as a community do that better and, and how can we better explain those less visible uses of these precious resources? So that's a great question. Um, so, so I'm going to give you two answers. One's the gut answer and one's the brain answer. Is that okay? Sure. Like system Stephen one, Colbert. system two, if you, if you know um, Danny Kahneman's work. So my gut answer is, is that you have to start somewhere. And if I started with things that were invisible to the eye, as the little prince would say, um, that all of the data would be relatively flatlined, right? And yeah, but, but I mean, that's not, to me, we, we need, you need to start somewhere, somewhere where you can actually start the conversation with somebody. So how do I make embodied water in foods more visible? That's really hard. People are talking about carbon labeling for foods, but the uncertainty bars are so high. The uncertainty bars for water, embodied water is really high. And in fact, if you look at the data that's available for embodied water in foods, it actually comes from this one group, waterfootprint.org, that are sort of from Europe that are averaged out for the entire, I mean, so basically it's specific for specific countries in Europe that people in California are, adopt, are just pulling those numbers and using them and saying that these are the numbers for California, but that's wrong, right? And then, for example, the New York Times and the LA Times did this beautiful, beautiful graphics, and they were all using waterfootprint.org numbers, and they don't have uncertainty bars, and lots and lots of issues, right? So that's my first gut answer, which is, I think you need to start with something that people can hook onto, right? Because if, I mean, the embodied water amount, I mean, I think that that is just too, too challenging. Like, if you were to ask water experts, they would not know. Now we know about almonds, but besides almonds, and we know about meat, but besides meat, <laughs> besides meat and almonds, it's hard. So that's, a, that's the first gut answer. I think the second question, the second part of your question, which is we are doing a disservice, I think, I actually think we are, right? And, and there are multiple reasons for it. And you, you brought up one, and, and actually we have a research project right now that we just submitted that relates to it is that how much of our own individual behavior are we willing to sort of talk about when it comes to conserving resources? Listen, I flew here. I'm a vegetarian, don't have kids, but I flew here. Um, so I think that, and sometimes I like eating bananas and they're not local <laughs> in Indiana. I don't know about Texas. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, so uh, I, think, I think making that connection to individual behavior is both challenging but needed. And I think, and, on a, so, and now I'm going back to the gut, I think one of the challenges with climate change is that people really don't know what to do about it. And if they knew a little bit better that there was something that they could actually do about it, I think that we'd face less psychological reactance, psych less resistance to, to solving the problem. But I don't know how to deal with that, man. That's a great question. <laughs> yeah. But if you have a solution, please, uh, my email is asatari at indiana.edu. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Uh, I think you had briefly started to touch on this. You had mentioned Governor Brown's mandated uh, reduction in water use in California. Yeah. I wonder if there's been any sort of attempt to educate any part of the public as to perceptions versus realities regarding water use. And in California? Has, yeah, and has your research interacted with that issue at all in any way? Uh, a little bit. So. Um, so this goes back to the previous question as well. So he put a mandatory restriction on urban potable water use, not agricultural water use. So that also sort of speaks to your question. Uh, and then the other question is which one is more elastic, or residential or agricultural, but I'm not going to get into that. Um, so there are uh, companies that are actually stepping in. Rather than correcting perceptions, they're going around it. So for example, um, social comparisons have shown to be very effective to decreasing resource use, but to a small, uh, it's a small effect size. So let me quickly explain what that means. So Bob Cialdini, back in the day, got people to reuse their hotel towels by telling them, you know, the, the uh, people that lived in this room 
reuse their towels. Would you help us by reusing your towel? Right? So now Opower, which is a company, they are using social comparisons. This is how much more electricity you're using than your most efficient neighbor. Right? And so people feel the sense of competition and then they decrease their electricity use. Water Smart has, is a new company that just entered this uh, regime. They're very active in California and they found a 5% decrease in water use by providing social comparison data. Now, but again, this is a different causal pathway. They're not educating people about how, where water you, is being used and this is your system's thinking which is really accurate. And all. They don't do any of this stuff, right? They're just telling you how much water you're using compared to your most efficient neighbor. So they sort of went completely around the whole perceptions problem. And they got people to decrease water use, but by 5%. Hello, thank you for your presentation. And this might seem silly, but how is the water infrastructure being outdated? How is, why, why are we getting a D plus on our infrastructure? Because we don't spend any money on trying to repair it. <laughs> and it's really, really old. And um, there are actually a lot of problems with our infrastructure. Um, I'm not an infrastructure expert, but this is what the, the report card says, is that we need a lot more investment in infrastructure. So things, so f again, this goes back to what is invisible to the eye, right? Um, it's really hard to detect leaks, but leaks is a no-brainer way to save water. If I have a leak in a, in a main, I should just very easily just go in there, fix it, make sure that there's no leaks, and then uh, transmit water uh, or transport water. Um, a, a, a rough estimate from the AWA, which is the American Water, Water Works Association, they basically say roughly 10% of all of our treated water is lost through leaks. So that's just one example of why um, our infrastructure needs improvement. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I just wanted to participate in that uh, conversation regarding embedded water in other material systems, because that's, that's very interesting. And another complicating factor, of course, is that uh, in terms of water especially, that's not uniform from place mm -hmm. to place. My wife and I go back and forth uh, traveling between two destinations, and water in Austin, very precious, but where, I, where we visit in Colorado, it's cheap. I mean, we're not consuming the water. It's a, just a shallow well. We use it. It goes right back into a septic tank. We can use as much water we want all the time, and it's essentially it's free. And so that, that aspect of embedded water is important. We can focus on it, but how important is it that it's a water-intensive good if it were produced in an area where water is essentially freely available and free? It's arguably an optimized system. We want that product to be produced there and delivered to us. And so I had a question what you thought about carbon actually being, in some ways, an easier problem to address because the impact is universal. It does not matter where I produce it. The impact environmentally is the same. So in many ways, that's a levelized problem. If it's conserved anywhere, that has benefit to everyone. So you're absolutely right. Yeah, there was no question. I agree. <laughs> Uh, I agree, but the, the politics of carbon, yeah? That's, but it's a, that's a really good point. Um, and I think that's another really interesting difference. If you, So I, th I think we need to start coming up with these libraries of landscapes. Like we have carbon, electricity, different forms of electricity, natural gas, uh, so on and so forth, gasoline, uh, water, different forms of water. Uh, I, I don't, I mean, we've been talking about a carbon price for how long? Since the 1980s at least. That's when Jim Hansen went to Congress and, you know, had that uh, famous discussion with them. Uh, not much has happened since then, I'm allowed to say, yeah. Anyways, yep. Um, appreciate all the <clears throat> information you provided. It's amazing and very much needed. Um, we provide some education to, to school-aged children, and I agree we're, we're really not addressing all the aspects of it. We just talk about conservation, efficiency, and, you know, don't <clears throat> really talk about where it comes or how it's made or, or I mean, we, you know, I work for a state agency, so we don't get into the, all that because it's, too political, I think. Um, 
I'm interested in where you think you're going to use this gaming. Everywhere. No, okay. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, it's, you so know. So we're, we're planning to have it, uh, once it's ready, free, anyone can access it. Okay, yeah. I think it'll be great for, for school age kids. I think it'll be great for everybody, but I see a definite place for it in, in the classroom. Yeah, actually, a, a lot of utilities have also talked to us about uh, they're ready to play the game. We just have to make the game. But yeah. All right. I have a question. If nobody else has a question. <laughs> what? Um, I was wondering uh, for the case where you had uh, the students draw mm -hmm. the, the water system, um, how did you end up getting the students, one, and did you prime them in any way at all? Like, so how do you get them prepared to even be motivated to draw? Like, was there anything that you had to do in that end? I thought students loved drawing. No, okay, um, uh, valid question. So here, here's uh, how we did it. We made a list of all of the professors we could have access to, I mean, in SPIA. I'm a professor there, so they knew who I was. And we just basically asked them, and these, this was across the curriculum, so it wasn't just friends of mine. Uh, across the curriculum, we specifically asked professors whether we could come into the class and just use 20 minutes at the beginning of class. Many said yes. So this was th uh, classes like nonprofit management, environmental studies, um, water, wastewater treatment, so on and so forth. So we went through these classes, and all we did was, you know, we're doing, uh, we're doing research. This has been IRB approved. Um, could you just take 20 minutes to fill out the survey? And stu students uh, gave out the survey, and the instructions were, as I pointed out before on the slide, this was the first page, right? After, after they saw, after, you know, we got informed consent, which basically asked them just to draw out the picture. Now, even though we asked everyone to draw it, so we got, um, let me go back here. So we had 578 students give us back surveys, but not everyone drew a diagram, right? So only 457 drew the diagram. So you just asked? Thank you. Yeah, and we didn't pay them. All right, well, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you so much for your attention. It was a lot of fun. Uh, go Longhorns, again. And uh, yeah, thank you so much.